Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman and it's time for your weekly wrap up and I want to begin first as we always do by thanking our newest Patreon supporters. We have Patrick Manthe and Ralph Movia. I want to thank both of you for your generous contributions to the channel as well as everyone who has been contributing on that Patreon as well as all of you who subscribe and watch as well because we are growing and I really appreciate all the support from everyone who's been a part of whatever this is becoming. So thank you all for that. So what do we do this week? Well, I uploaded four more videos to the Extras channel. Uh, two of them are snippets that I pulled out of last week's wrap-up, but we also had a couple of unboxings, including that big 34-inch curved Samsung monitor, as well as the Amazon Fire Kids Edition. I'll be reviewing that shortly as well. And then on the main channel, we had the, uh, the end of our Synology series on uh, setting up and using their surveillance station software. So we did that. I'm probably going to do a review on the camera that I used because there was a lot of interest in that camera. So uh, stay tuned. It's actually a nice little camera. It's an Amcrest 1080p camera that uh, seemed to have a pretty decent image quality out of it and worked very well with surveillance stations. So we'll be uh, pursuing that a little bit more. We also looked at the Huawei MediaPad M3. This is a, uh, I think around $300 for an Android tablet that very much looks and feels like an iPad. So if you want an iPad alternative running Android that costs less, this might be worth taking a look at. You can find uh, the review along with everything else that I'm talking about here uh, down in the master playlist in the video description. We also looked at the Lima Ultra, which for all of you NAS enthusiasts was not something you were all that crazy about, but uh, it is, I'll, expl I'll talk more about this a little bit later in the video because I do think that uh, consumers will be encountering this thing and may want to find out more about it, which is why uh, we reviewed it. It wasn't the best device, it's got some potential, but I think uh, for the money you can get a NAS like a MyCloud or something and have a better experience. And of course, uh, we looked at that 34 inch widescreen monitor from Samsung, which is a really nice display and you can see all the uh, cool things you can do with it uh, down below in the video description. Now it's time for what is on my mind this week and today I want to talk about unofficial APKs for your Android device and a few months ago we were talking about Pokemon Go and how it may not install on devices that had less than two gigabytes of RAM but it would run on those devices if you were able to get a, a copy of the APK from an unofficial source and I was cautioning people at the time not to do that because who knows what you're downloading and uh, now is a pretty good example of why you want to be careful with those unofficial APKs that you get outside of the Google Play Store because a group called Zscaler, I guess they make a uh, antivirus for Android, uh, found that there was a Netflix app that was popping up on some of these unofficial uh, APK repositories that is pretty bad actually because after it installs, uh, you run it and then it deletes itself, but it installs memory resonant software that begins uh, basically turning your phone into a spy device, including access to the camera, uh, downloading all your emails, looking at text messages flying back and forth, really pretty much turning your phone again into a spy device. You can see more uh, about exactly what this thing does down below on that uh, link right there, but pretty scary stuff. And again, something to be really careful about if you're downloading APK files from someplace other than the Google Play Store or uh, the Amazon Store, because there is a risk involved and this is one of those things that I think will happen more and more frequently, especially as more Android devices get out among the public. And now it's time for some Q&A, and I got a really good question in here from Mr. RW Mac about the differences between hard drives, especially as it relates to surveillance and network attached storage. And of course, we just did that whole big series on the Synology surveillance station, and he's wondering uh, what drive should he choose? Would a desktop drive cut it? And I went on WD's website to do a little research today, and of course, they've got uh, four different types of main drives here, blue for desktop, kind of the Econo line. Uh, those used to be the green drives, so they merged them together with the blue drive. Uh, you've got the black drives, which are for performance. You've got the red drives for NAS and the purple for surveillance. And uh, surprisingly, WD was very clear about what their drives limitations are, especially related to surveillance activities. And uh, they just come out right and say it. The desktop drives are engineered for uh, occasional usage. In other words, being used a couple hours a day uh, very lightly and not designed for the kinds of uh, abuse, essentially, that they get put through uh, in a surveillance environment, especially if they're in a dusty environment or uh, in a place where there's not a lot of good ventilation and they heat up quite a bit. Uh, because these surveillance drives are being written to 24-7. As long as those cameras are on and sending data data into your surveillance server, whether it's a NAS or anything else, uh, those drives are constantly writing and probably deleting some of the older footage as they go. And it is intense to be able to do that nonstop. So there's certain hardware differences between the drives. They also have some ability to alleviate vibration and some other things on them as well, including heat. And all of those factors go into long-term reliability. And that is why I would say if you're doing surveillance, getting the purple drive is probably the way to go. And uh, one of the things also to keep in mind about all this is that there isn't much of a hardware difference 
difference, at least from what I can see, between the red and the purple and other brands, surveillance drives to Nash drives. They, all, they look like they're about the same level of quality, but I think there are some firmware differences that uh, make the surveillance drives a little bit more optimized for constant writes versus the Nash drives, which do a lot of reading and writing. So you'll have to just kind of figure out what you want to do. But I think if you are going to be using your NAS for surveillance as well as file serving, I would probably go with the purple drive just so that you uh, have performance where you need it for writing all that camera data constantly to it and also uh, being able to reliably serve your data to your network. And Rich Greger writes in with a question about segmenting your network for security purposes if you have one of these surveillance stations running on your NAS. And uh, what he's referring to is something I talked about probably about two or three months ago now, which is uh, creating a segmented IoT network within my home. So I've been very concerned about light bulbs and all these other things that uh, don't get their firmware updated all that often. And I wanted to prevent away from a vulnerability on a light bulb from uh, taking down my whole network or making it available to uh, the world to see through my light bulb, which is happening quite often these days. And uh, one of the things that I talked about was uh, the host of the Security Now podcast, Steve Gibson, talking about uh, creating a multiple router network where you have your all your computers on uh, one router and you have all your IoT on another router. And both of those are plugged into a third router, which then goes out to the internet. So things are isolated from each other. You really can't cross over from the IoT network over to the computer network, which was uh, what I was talking about. And what he's referring to here is whether it makes sense to do that with your uh, Synology system. And you know, that's a really a judgment call. What I, what I have found about Synology and actually most of the network attached storage brands out there, but Synology in particular, just because I have the most experience with it, uh, is that they are constantly patching it. So every couple of days I'm getting a new uh, security update or just a new regular update that updates all the vulnerabilities found in the open source software on the device and uh, keeps it up to date. But anytime you make things available to the world, you are uh, risking something in doing so. So you have to really decide whether or not you want to do that. I actually don't. I keep my uh, Synology here behind my NAT firewall. I don't really access it away from home. So if I need to have files that are available to me, I'll throw them on my Google Drive or Dropbox or something where I have two-factor authentication and somebody else is responsible for uh, keeping that server secure. But again, that's something you'll have to think about for yourself. But one thing you should think about, though, uh, related to all this data being transited on your network is that uh, those cameras are transmitting a lot of data, and that's certainly taking up some bandwidth that you might have been using on your network, especially if you are transmitting wirelessly from the camera into the rest of your network. That Wi-Fi will get saturated pretty quickly with all those cameras uh, communicating over it. So you might want to think about a separate dedicated Wi-Fi access point for your wireless cameras or maybe even segmenting your network just to uh, make sure that all that traffic isn't interfering with uh, what you're trying to do with your other computers on your network. So that might be a good reason to uh, segment everything, especially on the wireless side, because wireless is not a protocol that uh, lends itself to sharing very well, especially when there are uh, units on the network hogging all the bandwidth. Now, this next question is actually a conversation that I was eavesdropping on amongst some of you subscribers in regards to uh, whether or not the channel is huge, or if it is not huge, or if it may be huge in the future, or maybe not mainstream enough to be huge, or perhaps it might just remind you of a uh, 90s tech show. And actually, uh, the 90s tech show thing is pretty much my inspiration. That's the stuff I used to watch when I was younger, and I'm sure a lot of that just subconsciously has made its way into the set here. I'm not much of a set designer, nor a lighting designer, uh, nor an artist, so I did the best I could, and that's what we've uh, got here for the moment at least. But a lot of the other things just in the, in the style and approach are really about efficiency because, as you all know, I, I switch live to disk. In other words, I'm, uh, every time I hit the button here, it's actually changing the camera, and that's one more thing I don't have to edit uh, when I wrap up recording the video because I have very limited time to do what I do, so I try to make every moment I have uh, valuable, and that's why I do all this live switching as I go. I'm going to do a uh, new behind-the-scenes video soon so you can see exactly how I'm using all of this equipment. So I just upgraded the TriCaster software. It does some cool new stuff, so I wanted to show all of that uh, to you in the coming weeks. Now, uh, really, the, the bottom line with the channel as to whether or not I find it successful or view it as successful, I look at two things. Uh, one, of course, is subscriber growth, which has been great, and I've just been so humbled by uh, how many people have clicked that button and stayed with me as, as long as they have. So that's been a great thing. You have around 126,000 subscribers now, so that is awesome. But uh, the reality of this channel is that uh, I'm a commodity. Um, for most of the viewership that I get, around 1 million to 1.6 million a month, depending on uh, what's going on out there, uh, about 89% of that traffic comes from people who are searching or it comes from a YouTube video on 
on a similar product that I reviewed. So in other words, you might be on a CNET video talking about some product, and then my video might show up as the recommended video to see next. And what's happening is people are out there looking to buy a product, looking to get some reviews of it. They search for it. They find me or another video, which then links them over to me. They watch it, and they get the information that they want, hopefully, and they go away. And then maybe they'll come back uh, the next time they're looking for something. Uh, all 126,000 of you probably found me in that way. We've talked about that before as well. And uh, that is really what the, this channel mostly is as far as viewership is concerned. But I'm very mindful of the fact that I have a lot of subscribers now and I'm trying to do more content to uh, keep you engaged and engage with all of you like the weekly wrap up once a week, but also being very mindful of uh, really the fact is that I'm a search commodity and I need to make sure that in order for the channel to continue growing, I have to keep feeding that, uh, that beast, in, in other words, to keep uh, things growing here. And uh, Jonathan Bennett here um, wrote in, about uh, the Lima review that we did this week because he felt like that's something that I shouldn't have wasted my time on. And I, you know, certainly when I was reviewing it, I said this is really for the money, uh, nowhere near as good as a WD MyCloud, for example, that you can buy for the same money or a little bit less and get all the functionality that the uh, Lima is missing. But the reason why I review products like the Lima uh, is that that for me, will do very well as a video. And I don't think it's really providing publicity for that product in so much as it's actually providing information to people thinking about buying it. And they are making some headway. I mean, they have a good retail presence on Amazon. I think they're sold at brick and mortar stores too. I think they're at Best Buy or a few other uh, retailers here in the United States. So the product is not unknown. It's something that's out there. It's something consumers are seeing when they're going shopping and they might be curious about it to see if it might meet their needs. And they will undoubtedly search for it, which will then lead them over to the channel. So sometimes, Things that I review like printers or this Lima thing or some other stuff might not appeal to the techies who are subscribing to this channel, but will certainly be a good search uh, avenue. I'm really curious to see how that video does. We'll come back and look at it maybe in six months and see where it's at. One of the things that's really surprised me about this channel, and actually this is what got me into it in the first place, is that some of the most benign stuff gets watched a lot. So uh, the thing that really led me to get into this was a hard drive I reviewed. Just like a, you know, out of the blister pack plastic Seagate hard drive, nothing crazy. Um, that was the first video that really took off here on the channel. It was shot with my iPhone. I had done it for the Amazon Vine program that I've talked about before, and whoa, it just became this huge big thing. So um, I just kept doing it, and that's really where this thing started from that. Um, so you'll see printers from time to time, boring as you, as you can imagine, but uh, actually boring to review sometimes too, but the printers out of many of the products that I review tend to bring in the most views over the long term because these products are out there in front of consumers again. And actually what's been really intriguing is that uh, they're coming to me not for a review with the printer necessarily, but for uh, instructional advice as to how to use it. So I've actually been doing longer printer reviews lately to show some of the functionality so that when people are uh, having trouble with the printer they bought, they can find the video and kind of go from there. So that's kind of the stuff that I juggle with here is making sure that I'm providing good content for subscribers, but also bearing in mind that uh, well over 85% of my traffic month to month is coming from the commoditized uh, side of the business. And I think there's a lot of room for uh, commodity content out there. And the more I can put out, the more I will do uh, as far as growth and viewership and revenue. So that's really what I've been very mindful of is finding those little things that will do really well in search uh, while not forgetting about all of you as well. And that's definitely something I'm keeping an eye on. And just as an example of growth here, you can see uh, where I started back in 2012 when I was just putting up a couple of tech videos here or there uh, to where we are today. So the holiday season of 2014 really was my biggest growth period and it brought me up to the level that I'm at now. Uh, those spikes that you see uh, here over in uh, January of 20, 2015, actually December 2015, November, October, uh, you can see I really do well at the holidays and I kind of drop off. So we had a huge holiday season this year and my drop off is not down as far as it had been in the past. So incrementally, uh, things are growing as I'm going here. And a lot of that growth depends on me finding like the right combination of products for my style, for what people are looking for. So I'm always looking for uh, those little hidden search gems that might turn into something really big. So all those suggestions that you make to me are really helpful. I don't always buy and review everything that uh, you suggest, but uh, that really is helpful for me to gauge what people might be looking for out there so that I can make sure that I have a video that is filling all the search voids that might be out there. And Charles Griffin writes in with a, a fun note here about how it makes him cringe every time I put my fingers on brand new, super expensive monitors that most people could never afford. He goes, I guess you handle so many nice things almost daily, it's hard to think of them as special. And I think to some degree, this is a uh, throwback to the work that I do in IT because when you're in an IT environment in a mid-sized business, you're always getting stuff in. Every week or two, there's some new monitor or some new computer coming in. Not all of it super high-end expensive, but uh, new nonetheless. And I've always just looked at 
at it as, oh, here comes the you know workstation number 72 stuff. Let's take it out of the box, get it set it up and send it out to the floor. And uh, that's been the end of it because in the warehouse where we are, a lot of times this stuff uh, gets pretty dirty and banged up in a short period of time. So I often look at these things not so much as uh, beautiful objects and more as tools, but I think to some degree too, when you're reviewing things, uh, looking at the level of durability and not treating it poorly, but uh, roughing it up slightly to the point where you can see that it's, it's sturdy enough to handle the kind of use that it might find in a home with a family or maybe in a workplace where uh, multiple people are going to be touching it and moving it around and everything else. So that's definitely uh, the approach I take with it. But I will say that I, do, I really try to focus on uh, the less expensive stuff. This is a good opportunity through the Amazon Vine program to explore uh, something different on the channel, a widescreen display that we hadn't looked at before. But uh, generally, I try to keep it on the low end of the scale uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that I have to buy a lot of the things that I review, so it's a lot easier and less expensive for me to buy many inexpensive things than one big expensive thing. So that's part of it, but also because uh, there are more people looking for the inexpensive stuff than the expensive stuff, which is why uh, we do so much affordable product reviews here on the channel. And now it's time for a new segment on the wrap up called Channel of the Week. And that conversation uh, amongst all of you about my channel got me to thinking I should start sharing with you some of the things that I watch because I watch a lot of YouTube, at least in the time that I have available with the kids this and uh, my day job. But uh, there's a lot of great stuff on YouTube. I really, uh, really appreciate what independent content creators go through to make the content that they present to all of us. And I, I'm gonna start sharing some of the things that I watch. And it's not just tech either. I have a pretty varied interest. So I will be showing you a whole bunch of different things. And this week is a really unique one to start off everything with. Uh, Steve1989MRE Info. And if you like unboxings and you like history, uh, this is going to be the channel for you. You're going to spend months on this channel. This guy's got a lot of stuff. Uh, 98 different videos or more of him unboxing old military rations from even going back as far as the Civil War. And it's pretty amazing just to see this history here that uh, in many cases he's unboxing for the first time in 50, 60, or even 100 years in some cases. Really cool stuff. He has uh, stuff from many different nations also, so you can see how different armies ate during different points in history, especially even when they were combating each other. Uh, so if, again, if you're into history and military history, I think you'll really appreciate uh, what Steve1989 MRE Info is doing. And uh, what's really fascinating about this is that he occasionally will eat things that are very old, and he's pretty now a pretty good judge of determining what is safe to eat and what is not. Um, and he does eat quite a bit from what he opens up. It's not a gross out channel. He's not stupid, but uh, it's really fun to see him take a bite out of something. And he's so good at describing the smells and what he's tasting. It's really, it's really fun. So you definitely have to check it out and uh, let me know what you think. And I'd love to hear from all of you in our Q&A for You segment, uh, some of the channels that you watch on a regular basis, tech or otherwise. I'm always looking for more things to subscribe to. So uh, definitely let me know down in the comments section below. So now we've got a winner to announce because remember last week we had one more Plex Pass to give away and I have the winner here. It is Konstantin Sontag. So I'm going to be emailing you to uh, get your information and I will get that over to Plex and you will have a lifetime Plex Pass subscription courtesy of the folks at Plex. So I want to thank everyone who participated. We had over 312 this time, so a few more than the last go around. I'll let you know when we have more giveaways to do. I'm really looking to do more of these digital ones that I can give away internationally, but we'll still have some physical stuff to give away too in the coming months. So stay tuned. More giveaways will always be on the way. Now, if you want to help the channel, you can. You can sign up for a Plex account at lon.tv slash Plex. No credit card required, and we get a small uh, commission when you do that. You can also give Plex as a gift if you want to give a lifetime subscription to somebody at lon.tv slash Plex gift. We also have Patreon set up at lon.tv slash Patreon where you can make a monthly contribution to the channel. And of course, we've got YouTube fan funding for as long as they keep supporting it over at lon.tv. Just make sure you let me know you did it so I can put you on the end credit roll and thank you for your contribution too because they don't tell me when people do this. So I need to know from you directly. Now, if you want to connect with the channel, we have plenty of ways to do that. lon.tv slash extras is our extra channel where I upload unboxings and other supplementary content. So if you like what I do, I put more up there on a more frequent basis. Lon.tv slash email is where you can sign up for my email list. I just switched email providers and I'm not sure if the form is working. So uh, do me a favor, go over there and try to subscribe. If it doesn't work, uh, let me know. I know they're working on it, but I'm hoping it's going to be uh, up and running at this point. I've switched over to uh, ActiveCampaign from MailChimp. And the reason I did so was because 
Uh, they have a really nice way of integrating RSS feeds into the email. It was a little faster and a little bit more efficient, once again, uh, than what I was experiencing with MailChimp, and they were slightly less expensive also. So I did the switch. I'll let you know what I think of them in the coming weeks here. Uh, Lon.tv slash Facebook for the Facebook page. I do post a lot of stuff on there as well. And we have the store, which just got restocked, and a bunch of you already grabbed a bunch of stuff. So uh, there is more up there, and I'll be adding more uh, throughout the month here. I had a really good weekend where I had time to actually make a couple of videos, and then that gave me time to start straightening up. So I've been finding a lot of stuff that I needed to get rid of a while ago that I'm finally putting up on the store now. So uh, be on the lookout. Also, occasionally, some of the things that we get in here for free, I'll be uh, selling just for the cost of shipping. So uh, kind of like a giveaway without the contest. And I'm uh, doing that because I have so many things that the freight costs would kill me to give everything away. So I'm going to be doing some as a giveaway, and some will give away uh, for the cost of freight. And uh, it'll just be up there. So you got to keep checking and uh, we'll go from there. I may, I may start emailing you with some schedules as to when things might appear, but I'm not sure about that yet. So that'll do it for this week's weekly wrap-up. I want to thank all of you for your continued support of the channel. Things are going really well. I'll have more news for you on more things that are happening on the channel and elsewhere uh, in the coming weeks. But again, just keep, keep me uh, informed as to what you're doing and what you think and uh, things that I should be looking at. And I really, again, greatly appreciate uh, all of your comments, especially the constructive feedback like we had about that Lima review. Because that stuff really, I read it all. Even if I don't always reply, I do see it all. And I do appreciate it. And I realize, yes, my set isn't perfect. The audio is not great yet, but we're getting there. And as soon as I get more time, I will make improvements. But in the meantime, so far, we're still feeding the search beast and uh, we're going to keep on cranking away here. This is Lon Seib and thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by my Patreon supporters. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash Patreon to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.